we will be reading this morning from Philippians chapter 4, closing out our study in this book, and considering the way that God provides for his people, no matter their circumstances. This is Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed, indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's house. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are alone. By Christ your Son, our crown of life. You alone provide peace and comfort, contentment and joy. May we this day be reminded and directed afresh to, by your Spirit and word proclaimed, find our joy in the hordes of your treasure hall. May your Spirit fixate on our mind the goodness of our Father and make your word taught and proclaimed effective for all that we need this coming week to be content and to rejoice in you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to start with a story this morning. Uh, it is a fictional story, and it's a story that um, my mother told us when we were young, and I didn't want to ask her uh, to retell me the story because I didn't want to give away that I'd be reusing this story this morning. So some of the details are a little bit fuzzy uh, to me this morning, but I think we can get the gist of it. And I remember this story, I always think on it, and had very little to do at the time, I think, in my mind with this text, but more so about contentment in the Lord and our, about our desire to be giving and benevolent. Uh, so the story goes a little something like this. There was a, a large church that was hosting a fundraiser, um, a, a donation event for either money or clothing. I can't remember exactly which it was. Uh, and so they asked all of the families uh, to come and to, and to give to this uh, fund or this clothing donation box that they were putting together for the uh, needy families in their church. Uh, and so there was a family, I think, of five girls, and these girls went out and they gathered as much of the money that they had or as much of the clothing that they had uh, that they could spare between them. And they were a poor family. They were a poor family that gathered everything that they could such that they were the family that had given the most to this uh, event that the, that the church put on. And when it was time to discreetly give of uh, what they had received to the unwealthy families in their church, those in need, the people that received the gifts from the church were the family that had gathered the most. Here we found a family that didn't have much, that was overflowing with contentment such that they were willing to give everything that they had to those who were in need. Little did they know that they were the ones in need. Now, I think money is a really difficult topic in today's culture, uh, and we don't need to look far to find this out. Uh, I, I did some very brief research and found that some statistics, statistics show that 40% of people say that money affects their mental health. Um, other stats argue that uh, couples who argue once a week about money are 30% more likely to get a divorce. And that same study found that those same couples with no assets at the beginning of a three-year period are 70% more likely to get a divorce. 
Uh, ancient philosophers also talk in talking about the nature of friendship to find one of utility where uh, one person is regularly going to another for some sort of aid, usually financial, and they're friendships that don't last and they're friendships of uh, lesser virtue. And so money, I think, is a really difficult topic in today's uh, culture and really in every culture. And so Paul writes tenderly about it here. And I can't say that you know, in speaking from my own authority that I know some of the struggles that most of you are keenly aware with, whether it comes to paying for and ensuring the financial stability of your family, paying for your homes, your other bills, your house, your college, uh, you know, setting up a college fund for your kids, perhaps a marriage fund for your daughters, or uh, even ensuring the stability of your marriage through your financial security. Those are all deeply complex issues. And I think that at the heart of those issues often are, are, are anxiety and discontentment. Anxiety and discontentment. We are a people who are overshadowed by those things. At least in our culture, that's the truth. The heart of those two questions is for anxiety, do I have enough to survive? And for discontentment, do I have enough to be happy? And I can promise you today that our text speaks to these things. It's a history lesson for us, and we can see visibly from the life of Paul as he speaks from his own experience that the Lord does indeed provide for his people. But not only from Paul, but also from the Philippian church, what we learn today from them is that the Lord also provides. He provides for a church who's giving all that they can. And even in the midst of their own poverty, he provides for them also. And so children of God, that is those who are in Christ, can be totally confident in every way that God will provide all that they need from the abundance of the riches of his glory. And thus we may be content, have hearts overflowing with joy that are filled with Christ-centered joy in all things and in every circumstance. And we're going to learn this in three ways this morning. We're going to look first at the uh, contentment. In the gospel, in verse 10 to 13, we're going to look at fellowship in the gospel in verse 14 to 20. And then finally, the fruit of the gospel in verse 21 to 23. Contentment, fellowship, and fruit. Now, Paul says this morning, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Because joy for him, as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, is always rooted in the Lord. And I think it's interesting to note how many po times Paul uses these phrases. Nine times Paul uses the phrase, in the Lord, in Philippians. Three of those times he commends them to rejoice in the Lord. One of them is here this morning. Eight times he tells them to rejoice and to have joy. Five times he mentions joy to them in general. And 24 times Paul commends believers to rejoice in his other letters. One-third of those, Paul wrote 13 letters, one-third of his commendations for people to have joy is in this letter. This is a book about joy, a joy which has deep and pervasive roots and cannot be shaken because its root is in Christ. This is a joy that is unshakable because it recognizes that every good gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow or variation due to change. And that's an important fact for us to realize this morning because Paul says that we have, he rejoices in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Lord Jesus Christ is a reference to our union with him, him who makes us heirs and co-heirs with Christ, so that we have a father who sits enthroned among the cherubim and showers down every good gift upon those who he considers to be his children. This is a book about joy, a joy that we have in Christ because we have a loving father. But we wonder this morning, what is the occasion for joy on the account of Paul this morning? Why does Paul have joy on this occasion? Well, it's because the Philippian church has revived their concern for Paul here. Now, that word revived here is a word in, in Greek context that has a botanical uh, connotation. It, it paints an image of a plant blooming in the spring. And so their concern is like a flower that is blossoming, blossoming in the warmth of the sun. This safeguards us, this understanding safeguards us from the wrong interpretation of this text to think that the Philippian church had gotten lazy or was disconcerned about Paul. It was not that they did not care. It was simply, as he says, that they had no opportunity 
to care for him. And this could be any number of reasons. I think the easiest is to, is to simply say that um, they didn't have cell phones back then. You can't call up Paul and say, hey, where are you at? Uh, we want to wire transfer you a couple thousand dollars for uh, your stay in Rome. But they have to search for him or receive word from him. Paul is a traveling man. He's traveling across the known world, constantly on the move, proclaiming the gospel from wherever he is. And now he's in a Roman prison. So it must have been very hard for them to get word of the situation that Paul was in. But somehow, at last, word has reached the Philippian church about Paul's circumstances and how do they respond. Well, they respond by sending Epaphroditus. An eight-week, nine-week-long journey across, uh, across the known world to the center of the world to Rome, a journey that almost killed him, bearing gifts that the Philippian church had gathered for Paul. And notice here that Paul says, you revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, that double repetition of concern. All along, they have been worried, inquiring, and finally, they can help. And this word here, concern, is very interesting. It's the same word that Paul has used. When you see repetition in a book, as small as this, it's significant. Paul has used the word concern ten times in the book of Philippians, in his letter to them, to speak about their attitude, their mindset, or their way of thinking. He says to them, it's right for me to feel this way about you all when he writes to them in the beginning of this book. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, because both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, and before this he told them that he was praying for them. He tells them to be like-minded, to have the same mind coming from the attitude or the mind that Christ Jesus had. In chapter 3, he tells those who are, who are mature to have this mind amongst themselves, to be of the same mind. Now hear their thoughts, Paul says, have bloomed once again. And his word choice here draws us in to see the way that he connects their concern for the unity and of, of mind and spirit and goal that he has been encouraging them to have throughout this entire letter. But Paul makes a clarification as he issues these forth. He wants to make a distinction. He wants to be clear about something. He doesn't rejoice in the Lord because they've given, them, they've given him these gifts. Verse 11 to 12 says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Now, he's not saying that he's not thankful here. There are some who kind of assert that, that Paul really here is issuing a thankless thanks. Thanks for your gift, but I didn't really need it. I'm sure we've all heard that. <laughs> thanks for your gift. I didn't really need it. You know what? I, I'm pretty good on my own. I'm okay if I'm poor. I'm okay if I'm rich. It really doesn't mean that much to me. That's not what Paul is doing here. It's not a prideful, empty platitude. But he is saying he doesn't overflow with joy by the gift itself, but he valued their concern, a concern which arose for him out of their unity in the Lord. And so his joy is properly set in perspective. When he says he rejoices in the Lord, his joy is actually indeed caused by every spirit blessing in the heavenly places that he, he comments to the Ephesians, one of which is the unity of the body of believers that they have, their love for one another. And so Paul's words here also in verse 11 to 12 show that no matter the circumstance Paul, Paul, Paul is in, he can be confident that his joy comes from the Lord, that he will, he will provide for him. He will sustain him. And thus, he can be content in whatever circumstance and situation he finds himself in. And it's because he, his contentment, it's not tied, it's not undermined by the situations or the locations that he finds himself in. Paul does not root his joy in the circumstances of everyday life under the sun. He roots it in Christ Jesus, his Lord, and the benefits that he has that flow into him by the Spirit of God. Paul says, whatever situation here, and then he goes on to give us a picture of what situations and circumstances he has been experiencing. He says, I know how to be brought low. Here, this is the same word, by the way, that, that he used when he described the humility of Christ when he said in chapter 2, 
Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born of, of, of the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ emptied himself and he humbled himself. So Paul, too, has been humbled. And we see this is not just about money then. Though we'll get to that in a minute. Paul's specifically addressing here those things that make us feel of low or high social status. To depend on others or look like a person of low social status for Paul doesn't undermine his contentment. In Greek culture, when it's seen as a, a seriously inferior thing in society to depend on others, to ask others for their help, is to put yourself in their debt and to make yourself a low-class citizen. But here, Paul in a Roman prison, his contentment isn't undermined by his circumstances of lowly social status. But he says he also knows how to abound. That is, he knows how to be exalted in a society such that his contentment is not contingent upon it. And I think that this is conceivable to us. We all know someone who, upon being highly exalted to a new station in life, become puffed up with pride or with arrogance, such that that is what serves their joy, their pride, their contentment, and their experience of everyday life. That's what drives them, their accolades, their station in life. It's a self-aggrandizement that ruins them. But Paul also says here for the third thing that he has learned the secret of facing hunger and need. And so we can find from this that there are times when Paul being poor, not having much resources, not having money, he is starving where he lacks the supplies that he needs for everyday life. And so he may not lack only food to sustain his bodily hunger, but he may lack a myriad of other supplies like clothes or like the resources to purchase new sandals because he has worn his old pair out from his long and arduous travel, travels on the road. And we could pause for a moment. That's otherworldly to us. For someone to say that their contentment is not tied to the provision that they feel in regards to food, for them to be sitting there hungry, holding their stomach, and to still find contentment and joy in the Lord and in their everyday circumstances. I don't think we understand that. Dennis Johnson notes this well. He says, when I hear Paul say that he can respond to near starvation without resenting God's providence or env envying the well-fed, I am embarrassed by how little it takes to unsettle my contentment. A car that needs repair, a computer that boots up slowly, a tough steak. How about you? What is it that defines our peace and our enjoyment of everyday life? Perhaps it's not related to money or provision. Perhaps it's how well-behaved our children are. Perhaps it's how well our day at work went. Perhaps it's the security of our company or our station in it. You see, in a culture of abundance where we have more than we need and less than we want, we come to allow even the smallest of inconveniences to unsettle our day and question God's provision for us. And that's what I think is really at the heart of discontentment, a proclivity to distrust God's goodness, the assumption that he is actually withholding his goodness from us. And I think we're confident that we can say that's the same thing that Eve did in the garden when she ate of the fruit. You've withheld this from me, Father. You've withheld this good thing from me. I am going to disobey you and partake. She was discontent with what God had given her. We didn't get what we wanted, and we allowed it the power to undermine our trust in God and give us all we need and therefore direct our way. But Paul also says here not only that it's uh, his station of poverty, of lack, of want, and need, but he also said it, says that he's learned to be content when he is facing plenty and when he is facing abundance. And here also we need to stop. It may not be immediately apparent to us that this is a problem that we face. We live in a first world country where we have overwhelming abundance. We are not, for the most part, in need. And yet because we define our contentment by whether or not we have what we think we need, we are one of the most depressed and anxious people in the world. And so what's the result? 
Well, despite the fact that we're abundant, an abundant people, we do not trust God to provide for us. It is inconceivable that we could be hungry and still be content, that we could be starving and still trust the Lord to provide for us in that moment. And so we learn that we shouldn't look to anything in the created order to be our Messiah. He came to make you an heir of a father who promises to provide exactly what you need for every moment of your life. And moreover, if we realize that we are richly blessed, that we don't have any immediately, immediate needs, the challenge surprisingly prevents it to, to any, present, presents itself to any person who is rich. Is it enough? The rich man thinks. Is it enough? The problem is the same for the rich man as much as it is for the poor man. What drives their sense of contentment and joy is what they have or don't have yet. Wealthy people, comments Dennis Johnson, tend to set their certainty on riches rather than God. And therefore, nothing is ever enough. I think we're a wealthy people. And we think that will make us happy. We define something other than Christ that will bring us joy and contentment and security. That's where we lay our trust. But as we look across the globe, the Westerners are going to Africa where they don't even have running water in some places and yet they are some of the most happiest and abundant people in terms of joy and contentment in the world. And conversely, we're some of the most depressed and anxious people in the world and look at all that we have. It's not enough. Look at how our abundance has made us a depressed and anxious people. We have more than we need and less than we want. I'm reminded as I was meditating on this text of a friend who coming from Africa moved to the United States. And in his first couple of weeks here, he made some friends who went out to eat one evening for dinner. And, and when he came to America, he had nothing but $100 in his bank account. Uh, he, the first thing that he did was he purchased a, a very dinky and um, really under quality compared to what most of us are used to smartphone for $90. And he had $10 left in his bank account. And uh, as he was out eating with his friends, uh, another one of the young men there asked if he could borrow money or if somebody could pay for his food. And every single other person there said, no, we don't trust you to pay us back. But this friend, this man, who had nothing but $10 in his bank account, and certainly in his vision of the future, no foreseeable way that he would ever make enough money to pay off the debts that he would incur living here should he go back to his country gave freely of his ten dollars to this other man he gave in his own poverty he was the most he was the one most willing to give this is a thing that we need to learn contentment in poverty contentment in riches and notice what paul says here i have learned i i know i know i have learned i have learned in, in whatever situation i am to be uh, i am to be content I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I have learned the secret of facing plenty. So he sandwiches what he has learned between the process of getting to learn it, the challenge of learning it. Learning this is hard. It's a task that must be engaged in, that we must fight our hearts to do, to rest securely in the promise of God that he will provide for us. Believe it or not, even Jesus had to learn something here on earth. Hebrews 5.8 says that Jesus had to learn obedience through what he suffered. And so Paul, too, had to, like Christ in his humanity, learn what it meant to be content in the Lord, to rest in his provision. And now we wonder, what is this contentment that Paul speaks of? Well, surprisingly, the word that he uses here is the same word that the Stoics used for self-sufficiency. Now, if you know anything about Stoics, you know that their goal in life was really to be um, unaffected, unchanged by the circumstances in life that they experienced whether painful or euphoric. They didn't want to be affected by it. They wanted to remain unchanged, to become emotionally self-sufficient by isolation from both pain and pleasure, unaffected by anything outside of the self. But self-sufficiency, unfortunately for them, doesn't shield you from danger and anxiety and pain and discontentment and sorrow. It isolates you in it and leaves you abandoned in it. And so our contentment is not like the self-sufficiency of the Stoics. 
Our contentment and our joy comes from Christ's sufficiency, not self-sufficiency. Our help comes from outside and from above. It doesn't come from anything horizontal, anything that we can see or touch or taste or feel. And so we ought to look to Him, to abide in Him for joy and for peace and for comfort amidst our circumstances. That's the secret that Paul has come to know that he, t- he talks about. And that word secret here, that he's come to know, conveys another interesting thing. It's a word that pagans would use for pagan initiation rites. Rites that were kept ser- secret and mysterious, where only insiders who uh, had, had walked this hard and challenging journey had figured out these mysterious and deep mysteries. But Paul here is proclaiming that secret. He's proclaiming that mystery boldly to the world, to the ends of the earth. And here I ask you, does your stock portfolio, does your worth on your house, the college fund that you have set aside aside for your kids provide your security, your joy, your contentment? Or is it perhaps something different that you want or that you crave? Kids, is it a new soccer ball, a new video game? Is it a wife? A child, a new job, what's your idol? What are you tempted to look what, look for, X, Y, or Z, for peace and for contentment? Rather than doing the hard task of learning to trust God to provide you all that you need in Him. I was talking with my roommate several months ago as I was considering this text. Is Christ not enough? Or can we confess that in Him and Him alone is all that we need to sustain the contentment and the joy of our hearts until we come to dwell with Him in the fullness and the richness of His presence where we will see His face and know Him as as the Apostle John writes, as He is. It sounds crazy. Maybe it's unrealistic to say confidently that God will provide for us in our every need, even if we're poor. Paul says in poverty, I know that God will provide for me. He will strengthen me to be content. And that's what verse 13 is about. It's not a get out, get out of jail free card. I'm sure we've all heard people misuse this verse. Kids, as you grow up, people will say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And they use that to mean they can go climb Mount Everest. That's not what this verse is about. He means the things that he can do are the things that he's just described Everyday life, the situations that God has called him to, the circumstances that he has placed him in, whether high or low, whether in abundance or in absolute abject need where he has nothing, he doesn't know where his next meal will come from. He knows that God will provide for him and give him the strength he needs to trust him to provide. In all things, in all places that Paul finds himself, Christ is his strength to get through it. Not because he set that agenda for himself and said, one day I'm going to climb Mount Everest and I can do it because Jesus strengthens me. But because God has placed me in this job, God has placed me in this family, God has placed me in this school, God has placed me in this home where the plumbing is garbage and I can be content in him because Christ is my strength. Paul now moves from the example of his own life to the provision that he experienced, uh, or excuse me, <clears throat> the provision that he experienced to the experience of those with whom he had fellowship. He moves to the fellowship that he has in the gospel with his brothers and sisters. And so he brings up the way that they have supported him in verse 14 to 20. We find here direct evidence, though Paul wasn't careless and lazy, that he trusted the Lord to provide for him in his circumstances and in what he had, God had called him to do. Paul, sitting in a Roman prison with no idea how he was going to get more money, trusted the Lord, and the Lord provided through the Philippian church. Here's a visible example that we can look back on in history. But more than that, Paul experiences also fellowship with them in the same suffering, that together they are building up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. So we have considered that the Philippian church is suffering persecution, but we haven't considered their poverty. It's not just talking about persecution, but 2 Corinthians 8, 1-5 says the following. 
We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Philippi is in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. Excuse me, and beyond the means of their accord begging us earnestly, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. This is a church that is almost entirely alone in their desire to serve Paul and support him. They've given not just to Paul, but to the churches in Judea who are being persecuted by the Judaizers. They are a people that are poor, and yet they have poured out their lives for the needs of the saints and the preservation of God's people and the promulgation, the, that is, the going out of his gospel and his kingdom. Like the young women in the story that we looked at this morning who gathered all their clothes and money to donate, the Philippian church in Macedonia has been supporting Paul, though they themselves did not have abundant wealth to pour out. And so when we look at verse 15 and 16, we're quite shocked. Paul says here, and you, and you Philippians, yourselves, you know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into part partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So their support has not just been a one-time endeavor. When no other church would support Paul, the apostle Philippi did. They were poor. They were poor, and their giving had become well known to the churches uh, 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 that Paul was writing to, that Paul ministered to. Not only was it late in their apostolic work that, that they had supported Paul as he went about in the rest of his missionary journeys after they had become a well-established church, they were a small church. Here's where it's applicable to us. In Acts, we're told that Paul went straight from Philippi to Thessalonica. So here we find that even then, when they were a young, baby, fledgling church, when they had a small amount of collective resources, when they, when they had only just begun to believe they had already supported Paul from the moment that he left them. Can you imagine that in our modern day? Could you imagine making a friend who, moments after meeting him and, 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 and determining that, oh, I like this guy, he's my friend, he, he asks you, hey, can I borrow a couple thousand dollars? <laughs> we wouldn't feel that request. This church so believed the word of life that was proclaimed to them that they were willing to give when they didn't even have that much security in their provisions. When they didn't know that they would meet their, their rent the following month, they made ends meet to gather what they can for the gospel to go forth. And so at the end of verse 16, Paul says once and again, we could better render this time and again as in a regular thing the Philippian church did for Paul. That's a lot of trust in the Lord to provide for them. They weren't building their stock for portfolios, it would seem. Paul in verse 17 to 20 then goes on to encourage them, this poor and suffering church, even further in his letter. <clears throat> in verse 17, he doesn't say, or he says that he doesn't want the gift for the gift's sake. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He's not greedy for money or for security, such that it robs them of their comfortable circumstances. Nobody likes, and especially the Apostle Paul, nobody likes to take from a poor person. It'd be like going to a homeless man on the street and taking the one coat that he has. Paul isn't greedy for money, rather the fruit that would yield from his labors, watered by their works, is what he's concerned for. The Philippian church was once a recipient of the word of life that Paul preached amongst them. And they want Paul to bring that message and pour it out into others as well, so that those like them who are pagan might come to walk in the light of the kingdom of God. And so Paul is saying here that he seeks the fruit that would be produced by the water which you enabled me to pour out. So this is their investment with Paul, just as much as it is Paul's investment into, the, into these peoples to proclaim the gospel to them. 
They want others to know, like them, the word of life that they now have. That's what fuels their desire to so willingly give, is that God's kingdom would go forth, that this gospel would be boldly proclaimed to the ends of the earth. This church that has given everything they can of their hearts and wallets to support him, Paul, now encourages even further. And so he tells them, I've received it all. Because of you, I have received full support. I'm well supplied. I have everything that I need and more. Thank you. Thank you for your gift, your support for me for the sake of the gospel, the way that you have poured out yourselves for my sake and for the advancement of the message that you once received. It is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to the Lord. In other words, it's not just producing Paul and Paul the ability to proclaim the gospel. It is also pleasing in the sight of God. It is like the sacrifices that Israel would give, the meat that they would burn on the altar, a sweet aroma that arises to the Lord and is pleasing in His sight. Your gifts in the eyes of God are a good investment. It is worth its weight in glory. And finally, Paul makes a, his promise a similar one to the conclusion that he made concerning his own, his own life in verse 13. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God be the glory forever and ever. My God will supply every need you have according to his riches in glory. When you are committed to the, the proclamation of the gospel, to the work of the kingdom... You don't need to worry about whether or not the Lord will keep you from perishing in your own circumstances. And I'm not saying be, uh, be a person who sits on their hands and uh, does nothing, right? That's not what Paul's saying here. He's not saying go twiddle your thumbs and wait for a job to come across you or you know, don't, don't worry about money and uh, check out and, and be frivolous with it. That's not what Paul is teaching. He's teaching that in your work, God has given you all that you need to be content and to share abundantly with those in need. And we can trust him for this. The same God who is pleased by your willingness to trust him and to give to his kingdom is the same God who now promises to supply every need of yours. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that they have every spirit blessing in the heavenly places. He wrote to the Romans and he said how vast the benefits divine since God is the creator of all things, since he is the one in whom the treasure hoards of all blessings dwell, he pours it out on his people who are in Christ Jesus and thus his children. And therefore you can be confident that God will indeed, as your father, not withhold his very best from you. And he does this, Paul emphasizes chiefly here to display his glory, to make it known to the ends of the earth. What does it say to the world when they see a people like the Philippian church? What does it say to us even when we consider the people in Africa who do not have much in these small village towns? who are being persecuted by their faith. They are overflowing with joy. What does it say to us? They really believe this gospel. This gospel has transcendent meaning in their life and it dominates their existence so that they are overflowing with contentment and joy. And that kind of contentment and joy in the face of pagans, in the face of want, in the face of poverty, in the face of a high station in life such that you don't exalt yourself, when you use these things rightly, it's a witness to a world that does not know God of the joy and the treasure evermore that is in the presence of God and God alone. And that's to His glory, to His praise, and it exalts His name above the earth. I think our passage really does tell us something today. It's not just about riches, the riches of God's glory and providing everything that His people need. Uh, but it also teaches us something, I think, about tithing and our willingness to give to the Lord and see, and see his kingdom work accomplished. I can tell you from uh, the myriads of conversations that I've had with people my own age that their, their, their emphasis, their goal in life is the next, the next property that they purchase. The next diversified portfolio, the next, the next source of or stream of income, the next stock that they hit rich in. That's what they're concerned about. 
It's never enough what they have. It's never enough. I was talking to a deacon a couple of years ago who was speaking to me about the situation in his church. Uh, this church was started in, uh, 70, 80, maybe 100 years ago. And um, when they first started, they were a poor church. They didn't have a lot of money. The, those men that are now grandparents or great-grandparents didn't have uh, multi-million dollar companies. And now fast forward a couple, you know, a couple of decades, and they have very wealthy companies. They've worked hard with their hands, and the steady and the steady uh, the steady giving to the Lord has only increased. That number every year is the same. Every month it's the same. But for their grandchildren, for their grandchildren, they tithe very irregularly. They re- very very irregularly give to the church. The number changes from month to month, if at all, on a regular basis. I think that story is, I think that fact is convicting. We have a proclivity to not trust the Lord to provide for us, and therefore we don't give to Him of what He's given to us. But it doesn't have to be about money either. It can be your resources, your time, the jobs that you take. What do they communicate about what you value? and where you place your confidence. What do they say about where your trust lies and what provides you contentment in everyday life under the sun? And we move finally, therefore, to our last point. What was the fruit of the gospel that they had watered in Rome through Paul? Well, first and foremost, it united believers in Philippi to believers who are in Rome. Though Philippians had their own tensions, their own uh, issues, the brothers in Rome are people they are united with and that greet them. And Paul even comments, commends them saying, greet every saint, even those who are in your congregation that you have disagreements with. Greet each and every one of them in the name of the Lord. You are all saints, holy, set apart people of God. But most especially the saints in Rome greet you. These brothers across the known world Send their kindest and most loving regards to you in your suffering and in your poverty and in your support of me. But much more than that, the member of Caesar's own household greet you. That's an awesome moment, isn't it? That's an awesome moment. Here's what your funds have produced in enabling me to serve. That even those in servants, those, that's what this means, this, the, uh, those of Caesar's household, servants. Even those servants in Caesar's household have come to believe this gospel message. The same Caesar, by the way, the same Caesar who people in, the Roman, in Roman culture worshipped as a god and therefore used as, a, as the grounds to persecute the Christian church, are now sending greetings. People in this man's own castle, his own court, are sending greetings to the church that is being persecuted by Rome. Those who were in this court have now, who were, who were far off, who were once sinners, have now, have now been uh, recipients of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul makes a declaration, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. The Lord in Paul's apostolic pronouncement upon the reading of this letter to this struggling and weak and weary congregation that's gathered in the midst of their persecution in poverty. Maybe they don't even have a building. Issues forth a pronouncement of divine grace that would rain down on them like a summer monsoon. It's not just any mess, any blessing, but a blessing that would go out with them into the week, that would carry with them in their hearts the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. As Dennis Johnson asked, is Christ himself the source of my security so that I am free to spend myself and my substance to help others encounter his love and thrive in his love? How often can you be more concerned for money or more stressed about what God has given you than focused on what the gospel, on the gospel and what it has provided. It is surely the most rich blessing that we have ever experienced and that we will ever. Therefore, let us not be focused on so much on what we do not have and doubt, therefore, the Father's goodness, therefore being apt to throw up our arms in disobedience from the way that he has called us to walk, but let us walk and trust in him. The secret 
that Paul proclaimed that the religious groups kept away in their pagan rites, he proclaims to the end of the earth. And when he says he can do all things through him who strengthens him, that is Christ, he means that whatever God calls him to do, he will indeed strengthen us to endure with contentment and trust in him to provide. That we might say with the psalmist, God is my refuge and my strength, my ever-present help in trouble. That we might say in the midst of our lamentation about the prosperity of the wicked, whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth there is nothing that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That we might with Jeremiah, the weeping prophet who lamented the des desolation of his land and the wickedness that he saw, say, Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, thy mercies are new each and every morning. For the more that we get to know Christ, the more that we come to find that he is the one who satisfies our hearts, not what we define his faithfulness to us by. Let's pray. O Lord our God, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy goodness. No earthly pleasure can compare. May we, despite the often dark and dire circumstances that we have faced from day to day, have complete contentment with wherever you may call us, that in plenty and in lack our hope would not be in what we can see or touch, but in the promise that you delivered to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and your people for thousands of years. Though we are often given over to greed, let us recognize your daily mercy to us this day, this morning, where your word is proclaimed in power and in truth, that our hearts may be encouraged by your spirit. For we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.